Spotted and Special. Korea Division was a product of the Cold War, but it has become internalized since then. It's a huge win for the United States and the international community if Korea is unified. focusing solely on the denuclearization has not worked. There could be some sort of major political event in the country, you know, in the next five years or so. Exactly 70 years ago, in the year 1945, when the Korean Peninsula was liberated from Japan's colonial rule, the joy of liberation was quickly dampened by the painful struggles that ensued resulting from the division of the country. The military demarcation line that was to stop temporarily the downward march by the Soviet Union became cemented into a demilitarized zone. Seven decades later, the Korean Peninsula remains the only divided country in the world. The issue of unification between the two Koreas may not be of the focal point of the world politics, but there's no denying that the issue has spillover effect on regional politics beyond the Korean borders. This is because a divided Korea has political, economic, and social implications, not only for neighboring countries, but the rest of the world. As Korea marks in 2015, the 70th anniversary of separation, we look at why unification is necessary, why it can no longer be delayed, and why it's an issue that the rest of the international community should take note of. We'll also look into what path we can take in order to achieve unification. Last year in October, a global conference on North Korean studies took place at a university in Seoul. Some 150 scholars and experts on North Korea participated. It was the first event of its kind to bring together North Korean experts from all over the world. At this conference, a variety of issues were discussed, not only in the field of politics and security, previously thought to be the center of North Korean studies, but also social and cultural issues, women's rights, urban studies, and science and technology. One of the most notable topics was economic change currently unfolding in North Korea. I first visited North Korea in 1996 and have been back 26 or 27 times now. This is just confined to Pyongyang, but I can tell living conditions have improved and uh, people are better off than they used to be, especially since Kim Jong-un took power. Younger people seem to be livelier and their clothes and other things are not much different from other countries in Northeast Asia, such as China, South Korea, and Japan. According to a scholar who recently visited the North, residents in Pyongyang are enjoying more affluence. It signals there are economic reforms taking place in the North, but what form are these changes adopting? 
Whether you want to call it capitalism or regular rules of the economy, North Korea has introduced China's method of independent competition. There are roughly 254 companies in Nazon, and I believe 138 of them are local companies. They've been spreading this across the country. North Korean companies have been adopting the so-called Chinese model of management, and this change is also found in agriculture. The Beida Huang Group has been carrying out farming in Heilongjiang using the Chinese method since 2009 across an area of 600 hectares. So production output is getting significantly higher. Before the output was only at 2.5 tons, but now it stands at 7.5. And the farm takes back 3.5 tons. This kind of method is now being adopted across the country. The greatest difference is that once people have paid their quota to the state, they own whatever is left over. The key words to describe uh, the situation in North Korea should be uh, changing, even further say accelerated changing. Uh, economic priority has been uh, replaced uh, military first as the new focus of their strategy. Although on the surface uh, you say uh, they ha uh, the new leader raised the new track strategy, say development of the economy and development of the uh, nuclear weapon. However, if you compare it with the two items, economy and a nuclear weapon, uh, you know the gravity is obviously at the economy. Pyongyang's priority on economic development and changes we're seeing in its economy. But the question remains as to whether this will lead to a full reform and opening of the country and a consequent collapse of the dictatorship. Capitalism is an economic system. So capitalism can go along with the dictatorship pretty well. Capitalism is not a factor to undermine the rule of the dictatorship. So some people expect that capitalism can undermine the Kim Jong-un's uh, uh, regime. I think uh, they, they need a more uh, cautious theoretical analysis. Well, some experts uh, believe that there are some new trends in North Korea. Uh, they uh, stress that uh, the country is changing and uh, there are a lot of evidence of it. Uh, and there are new uh, food market and there are some uh, new business activity. But to my mind, in general, the situation is very gloomy. And the reason is that their uh, old system, all administrative system, doesn't work. However, signs of change within the North are seen not only in the economic sector, but at the heart of power and in the political circle as well. The many reshuffles and purges since Kim Jong-un came into power offers evidence for this. Once Chang Song Tae was executed, which was very a big surprise to all of us, North Korea executing Kim Jong-un, executing his own uncle. Um, what that at least told us was that there's elite disunity. Something is going on at the elite level. And I doubt that elites truly support him in a real way. They support him in the sense that, yes, their fate is tied to Kim Jong-un. They have vested interests in co continuing this system, but it's not out of loyalty. And then there's also disunity. We can tell there's some sort of factional thing going on because of execution of Chang Song-tae and the fact that Kim Jong-un had to already do so many leadership reshuffles. I mean, imagine if in the United States we have a defense minister, six or seven defense ministers in two years. That cannot be a stable situation. Economic reform within the North and uncertainties in the leadership. These small signs of change seem to be indirect but positive indicators when it comes to the prospects of unification. Uh, I don't think any kind of changes inside North Korea can directly be conducive to the reunification. All measures and the policies designed to making changes are for better tomorrow, for better existences. No direct link, direct linkage with the reunification. However, a better North Korea, in my view, of course, 
is better for a、uh, peaceful unification. Last year, the South Korean government actively made efforts to create a better foundation for unification. The starting point of that was on March 28th, when President Park Geun-hye, during her trip to Germany, delivered a landmark speech known as the Dresden Declaration, outlining her three main North Korea policies. Wir sind ein Volk. Wir sind ein Volk. 통일 직후 동서독 주민들이 하나 되어 부른 뜨거운 외침이 평화 통일의 날 한반도에서도 꼭 울려 퍼질 것이라고 믿습니다. In order to build the foundation for a peaceful unification, it outlined that first humanitarian issues need to be resolved for the people of South and North Korea. Second, the infrastructure for the livelihood of people must be built to achieve coast prosperity. And third, A sense of common identity must be recovered. Seventy years since the division on the Korean Peninsula, and the president on a global stage declared that unification can no longer be delayed. Well, I think they made a conscious decision with the speech that the president gave in Dresden, Germany,、um, to really mark this as one of the key policy platforms for the government. Um, there are obviously political reasons for doing that, but I think it really comes down to a genuine concern that the South Korean public is not ready for unification. Unification is something that can occur now, and it can be a bonanza that comes with many economic benefits. This change in paradigm has shocked not only those at home, but in other countries as well. Right, to try to build trust between the two Koreas, first, first through very small actions, whether that is family reunions or something, but then to build upon that for more economic engagement. I think the the medium to longer term objective of building trust is that you want to try to foment some economic reform in the North. How successful has it been thus far? I think they've laid the foundation, they they created the framework about how they want to think about this.、Um, they've certainly tried. Uh, to engage with North Korea, I think they have tried. Well, you know, the Korean government has uh, uh, has uh, had a pendulum swing from left to right and right to left over the last 20 years, trying different approaches. And I think the the current administration under Park Geun-hye has found a a centrist approach. It's a combination of pressure, but also engagement and dialogue.、Um, uh, a certain amount of of resistance. To any sign of North Korean aggression, which I think is essential, but at the same time a willingness to expand people to people, to expand economic contacts, to expand engagement. What's most important is that unification is not a matter confined to the peninsula, but a process that requires the interest and support of surrounding countries. And this need has brought about actual responses from other nearby states. Park Geun-hye's administrations. Uh, played a very important role in、uh, liberating new type of relations between two Korean states. In this case, I would like to note、uh, the Eurasia Asia Initiative and Trust Politic initiatives. These kind of initiatives create a better conditions for improvement relations between two Korean states. Besides,、uh, Eurasia Asia initiatives. Uh, radically improve uh, political climate uh, in relation between uh, be between uh, the Republic of Korea and China, the Republic of Korea in Russia, and uh, uh, South Korea is uh, uh, closely connected with the United States. It is an American ally. At the same time,、uh, it seems to me that Park Geun Hye tried to、uh, to stimulate more flexible.、Uh, More uh, to to uh, to change policy、uh, in more flexible manner and、uh, improve relations with China in Russia in order to、uh, create better conditions for unification. Actually, it's not just this administration. For the past 70 years, for many of the past governments, unification has been a priority. But without any of the administrations able to achieve that goal. In the year 2015, Korea still remains the only divided country in the world.
For the past seven decades, separation has been at the center of political, economic, and social struggles. These struggles ironically began with the moment of liberation from Japan's colonial rule in the year of 1945. So with the sudden end of Japanese colonial rule on August 15, 1945, it became a very complicated situation in Korea. Different Korean forces and individuals came back to Korea or emerged from underground who wanted to have a share in the government of Korea. The Korean government in exile returned, uh, Kim Gu, uh, Lee Seung man and others. But on top of that, there was a dual occupation with the Soviets occupying the North and the Americans occupying the South. So this foreign intervention combined with different divisions within the Korean population made conflict almost inevitable. To deal with the remaining Japanese troops in the country, a line called the 38th Parallel was drawn for military operations as an administrative division. But as this transformed into a political boundary, that's when the seed of tragedy was planted on the Korean Peninsula. Well, remember that division was not supposed to be permanent. Division was a proposal that the Americans put forth to deal with the surrender of Japan at the end of World War II. They suggested it to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union agreed that they would come into Korea to accept the Japanese surrender, and then there will be some sort of independent Korean government. So it would have been a surprise to everyone involved at the time that here, 70 years later, Korea is still divided. This was not supposed to be a permanent solution. In December of the Year of Liberation, the foreign ministers of the U.S., the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union convened in Moscow to discuss the issue of the Korean Peninsula. At this meeting, they decided that the U.S. and Soviet Union would put in place a trusteeship that would rule for not longer than five years. Well, initially, there was no agreement between the occupying forces about what kind of independent Korean government there would be. The Soviets were supporting the communists in the north. The Americans were supporting their uh, people in the South and the uh, initial proposal for a trusteeship in which there would be a foreign uh, uh, rule of uh, the different powers in Korea was rejected by most Koreans. So it became a kind of uh, accident that division was long term. The joint Soviet-American Commission, though, that was working to establish an independent, democratic, and integrated government fell apart in August 1947. In September of the same year, the issue was brought in front of the United Nations. Even though elections were held, they were only held in the South in uh, 1948, and uh, they were not accepted as legitimate in the North. So, with the establishment of the Republic of Korea officially in Seoul in August 1948, the, the road to conflict was quite clear. It was almost inevitable because the North side refused to recognize this. Two different governments were established in Seoul and Pyongyang, and with the Cold War ongoing, on June 25, 1950, the Korean War broke out. The battle ended with an armistice, not a peace treaty, in 1953. And the division between the two Koreas became a long-standing arrangement. Yes, there were several opportunities for Korea to have maintained its unity if the Soviets and Americans had agreed on a format of unified Korea, if uh, all of the leaders had agreed on some sort of uh, unified process. There was a meeting in Pyongyang in April of 1948 to stave off division or just before the elections in the south, but th that failed. Um, or if the war had turned out in a different way. Uh, but none of those things happened, and in the end you have the solidification of the division, not as established by the 38th parallel in 1945, but as established by the Korean War armistice in 1953. 
The Korean Peninsula was divided as a result of the Korean War, and many around the world question. With the unification of Germany and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Cold War has come to an end. But how is North Korea still an operating state? Well, at that time, when, when Germany was divided, when Korea was divided, when Vietnam was divided, it was the situation of the Cold War, and you had two blocks, uh, and uh, you had these divided countries, um, and you don't have that anymore now. And as far as I see, uh, Korea is the last one in the, in the history who stays in the situation of the Cold War. It's hard to understand um, how the North Korean regime can manage uh, this kind of closeness uh, of their country um, uh, and um, the, the people still uh, accept it. I don't know how they manage it. I think it's a very strong, very strong oppression. You have much, much stronger as any comparative country in, in the East Bloc before. The, uh, these countries in Eastern Europe were really kept in power because of the Soviet military and Soviet support. North Korea was very much economically dependent on the Soviet Union, but politically they had asserted their independence for a long time. So. When the Soviet Union collapsed, it was an economic disaster for North Korea. But very quickly, the North Korean government stressed nationalism, patriotism, uh, ethnic unity of the Korean people as a kind of basis of legitimacy and said, we are not a socialist country like these other Soviet-style countries. We are our own independent socialist country. We have our own style socialism which is nationalistic, which is centered around the, the Kim family, and so forth. So they were able to survive through that. Apart for 70 years, during this lengthy separation, South and North Korea have seen many changes, ranging from language to culture. But there's one significant and most visible difference. This is a satellite image of the Korean Peninsula late at night. The north is engulfed in darkness, while the south lights up like an island. The north doesn't have the electricity to light up its streets, while the south shines brightly. It's a simple snapshot of the stark difference in economic status of the two Koreas. While the South is ranked the 14th largest economy in the world, the North is considered one of the poorest in the world. As this gap continues to grow, the road to unification becomes problematic. In the cities of countries that are geopolitically or economically connected to the Korean Peninsula, what do people in these neighboring countries think of when it comes to the peninsula or North Korea? Also, what are their thoughts on unification between the two Koreas? Um, maybe the barrier is just from the politics and maybe it's kind of hard. But I hope um, it can be a united country one day. We don't like North Korea <laughs> because they are so repressive and uh, they have no human rights. And all that we hear are bad things. I do not know anything about the interests of those countries, but my assumption is that South Korea would not, you know, favor that, but I don't know enough about that to speak much to it. I think when you say North Korea, there is an image of them being very dangerous. If the South is put in a similar state, I think that would be scary. But on the other hand, if they are unified and it brings peace, I think that's a good thing. Why then do the two Koreas need to be unified? Why can it not be further delayed? Also, why should people in neighboring countries also have interest in Korea's unification? How many countries remain divided in this world? Unification is a very pressing matter. Families are falling apart, unable to see each other's faces. Half of them are at age 80 or older. 
What is the politics that prevents these people from seeing their own families before they die? As of late September 2014, there remain 69,279 surviving members from separated families. As the years of division drag on, each year, three to 4,000 members die of old age. Of the surviving members, those in their 70s and older make up 81.5%, and those in their 80s or older account for 52.8%. At this rate, this year in 2015, the number of registered dead separated family members will for the first time surpass that of those surviving. In Germany, for example, the people over 65 in East Germany, they could visit when they were older than 65, they could visit West Germany. I think this, this, this possibility of communications and of writing letters to each other, for example, or using the phone and calling your relatives or friends, that is not possible in your country. So uh, the, the, the distance between both populations uh, nowadays, I think, is much, much bigger as it was in Germany uh, in 1980 or 1985 or 1989. North Korea's nuclear threat is the problem of the world. For more than two decades, the international community has made numerous efforts to resolve the nuclear problem in North Korea. But not one of those methods have brought about substantial results. We should turn to unification and consider it as being the easiest and only solution to Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions. I don't think they will give up. So unification may be the only solution. Therefore, it's important, you know, to talk about what to do with the unification process and the post-unification phase and how to deal with uh, nuclear weapons, which North Korea may have. I think that's a serious issue. The U.S. has been focused on denuclearization, uh, not on unification. And I think that's a little bit of a short-sighted policy because to me the key, the essence of denuclearization is that it is only possible when there is peace and security and probably even unification on the Korean Peninsula. I think our policy, United States policy, has been very myopic and ineffective, uh, making it all about the nuclear program, focusing solely on the denuclearization, has not worked, clearly. We tried it for 20 years in every different way. So that should no longer be the focus, which means we now need to stop uh, thinking only about the nuclear issue, but engage on the human rights activities. I think that's a very good thing, the recent developments in terms of human rights. And then we also need to sort of set this long-term goal of unification. There's one other issue that has been overlooked by the international community. That is human rights abuses taking place in North Korea. This past December, a movie preview event was held in Seoul for a documentary film. The 23 years of agony for Shin Dong-hyuk, who was born into a North Korean prison, was played out on the silver screen. Along with the movie, Shin offered detailed accounts of what happened. The issue of human rights in North Korea has received attention at such a late stage. It should have been this way a lot earlier. Too many people have died until now. Too many people have starved to death, and too many women have been trafficked. I'm relieved that at least now it has been put in the spotlight. Fortunately, last December, the international community saw some substantial achievements in this field. On December 22nd, the UN's most powerful body, the Security Council, for the first time placed the issue of North Korea's human rights on its official agenda. For South Koreans, people in North Korea are not just anybody's. Millions of South Koreans still have our family members and relatives living in the North. Even though we never hear from them, 
even though by now the pain of separation has become a cold fact of life. We know that they are there, just a few hundred kilometers away from where we live. We cannot read what is described in the COI report without it breaking our hearts. It's the third time in the Council's history to make such a move regarding a state's human rights conditions. This means, for the time being, human rights in the North can be discussed by the Security Council at any point if conditions deteriorate. It's also representative of just how much interest the international community now has in the matter. North Korea has been working on getting rid of evidence, so the global community needs to get involved and make sure no one falls victim to this act. We need to pressure them so no more crimes are committed. Unlike in the past, North Korea has reacted strongly to these movements, actively lobbying against them. This is also a significant change. We now know what North Korea hates. That is the issue of human rights and political prison camps. Uh, I'm very happy about uh, all the attention that's been finally paid to North Korean humanitarian situation. For too long, the United States government and the world has not prioritized human rights because we're overly focused on the nuclear issue and almost put aside human rights concerns. So I'm very, very happy the United Nations Commission on Inquiry and Human Rights, North Korea's Human Rights, released that 400-page report, landmark report, calling many of North Korea's human rights violations crimes against humanity, even naming Kim Jong-un himself. And what we didn't realize is that how much leverage that it actually has. Because had we realized that human rights issue was, was actually a leverage for the US government, we might have even pursued this even earlier. Because besides being uh, the right thing to do, North Korea is right now very, uh, almost traumatized by all this focus on human rights issue. This also shows that the fastest and most effective method in resolving the issue of human rights is through unification. In addition to security benefits, I think U.S. interest is all also about U.S. values. And in terms of human rights suffering, you are relieving 23 to 25 million North Korean people from the last Stalinist dictatorship. And America is all about our values. So I think that's another extremely important um, benefit for the U.S. and for the region. It's not just in the field of security and other social issues that unification must be sped up, there are also economic reasons. Since the division of the two countries, the economic gap between the South and North has been growing. With its continual growth, South Korea is poised to become the seventh country to enter the so-called 3050 Club this year, while North Korea's economy has crumbled, becoming one of the poorest countries in the world. Children who were born during the late 90s, during the arduous march, so those born in the Yanggangdo, Chagangdo, and Hamgyongbukdo provinces, they are the children who were starving already in their mother's wombs. Since then, they've always been hungry. If those children grow up, get married, and have children only to go through the same cycle, it's said that it changes the DNA of the people. What then happens to the nation? It's not a joke. In your country, I think the difference between North and South is much bigger, as it was in, in Germany between East and West. So uh, the, the economical consequences for the South will be uh, uh, much, much bigger in, in relationship as they were for us. Yeah, we, we, had to, we had to give a little bit and I think uh, uh, in, in case of reunification of Korea, um, it will be much stronger co consequences for the economical situation, also for the South Korean side. 
In the Korean case, North is one third of United Korea and the economic situation is a disaster. Uh, per capita income is 5%. So the level of improvement, the level of reform, the level of how much you have to raise productivity is much, much higher. Uh, we calculate that uh, um, you need about 20% of, of national product of Korea, South Korea, uh, to get North Korea on a path to reform. In the German case, it was about 5%. As the economic gap between the two Koreas grows, the cost for unification becomes greater. A unification with a growing burden is not beneficial for either side. I think in the short term, it's absolutely true that the cost of unification of the two Koreas is going to be much more costly than the unification of Germany. Um, economic gap is so much greater between North and South Korea than East and West Germany ever was. So for a whole host of reasons, economists predict that it will cost more than $1.9 trillion that it took for German unification. So some people even say it will be over $2 trillion in the immediate term. And I think that's right. I think it will be very costly. It is also a problem of how to persuade people that unification is necessary even if it means one side will have to shoulder most of the cost. I mean, nobody wants a 10 or 20 percent surcharge on their taxes, right? Nobody wants a new tax on top of a sales tax. Um, so yes, I can see why uh, a good number of the South Korean public look at unification with trepidation and uh, concern. But there's one thing people must not forget. There is also a cost of division that comes from security and other fields. Defense spending. South Korea spent $35 billion this year. Average is $30 to $31 billion a year. Uh, they, will, they can be lessened. And look at North Korea. North Korea spent $1.2 billion on ballistic missile program alone in 2012. So if two Koreas unify, all that cost that they're now spending on ballistic missiles program, nuclear program in the North Korean side, on the South Korean side, 30 some billion dollars um, can be merged and be spent towards uh, developing the country. On the other hand, there are great expectations for the economic benefits and effects that will derive from unification. This is another reason why it cannot be further delayed. You've heard the economic argument that uh, North Korea has, is sitting on uh, almost $6 trillion worth of natural resources, uh, where South Korea has no natural resources. South Korea has to import 97% of its resources and energy needs because it has none. Uh, South Korea is the fastest aging society, one of, um, in the world, second fastest aging society in the world. North Korea has relatively younger labor, work, labor and workforce. The most important success of Germany was that unification enforced an opening of labor markets in West Germany because of the pressure from East Germans to, uh, that looked for work. And that, in fact, implied that many East Germans started to work in West Germany, uh, produced goods there, and the financing of part of unification was simply done from taxes uh, uh, that were generated by additional uh, national wealth produced by East Germans in West Germany. And in my calculation that I make, we can think we, we, we think that the business case of unification is has been closed uh, or was closed about five years ago. The effects from unification just in economic production is estimated to stand at roughly 51 billion U.S. dollars a year. The GDP of a unified Korea is expected to increase by more than threefold within 45 years. Just looking at the economy in the South, that would be an annual 2.1% increase. It's not surprising that the South Korean government calls it a bonanza. There is much speculation that as time goes by, the benefits of unification will far outweigh the costs. Uh, with unification, South Korean growth will slow down, but it will never be negative. And that over a period of time, the aggregate growth of a unified Korea will far outpace the growth of South Korea's economy. You know, good things are never easy, right? Um, and 
So in this case, it will be challenging in the beginning, but it won't bankrupt Korea, for sure. Uh, and in the end, you know, if, if, if the cost line starts here and the benefit line starts here, they will eventually cross. Uh, and they will, they will cross within the lifetimes of the people who are experiencing unification. What we need to turn our attention to is the fact that surrounding countries will also benefit from Korea's unification. Before delving into how neighboring states will benefit, we'll first look at some of the common misperceptions and doubts people have about countries surrounding Korea when it comes to the issue of unification. The first question is, do neighboring countries truly want to see a unified Korea? There are a lot of strategists uh, in East Asia and Washington who think that having North Korea is sort of convenient for the United States because it gives the United States an excuse uh, <clears throat> to maintain a very strong military presence in Northeast Asia. China is very much concerned about unified Korea because of that losing buffer zone. Uh, China is concerned about U.S. troops remaining on the Korean Peninsula uh, and having unified Korea that's friendly towards the United States. China wants to, for North Korea to remain as is, even though we know that China is not happy with North Korea. Especially in Northeast Asia, some believe the U.S. and China might engage in a power struggle in the region in the face of Korea's unification. But is this true? I think that's, that uh, view is short-sighted. Um, the United States uh, is not trying to contain China. Uh, the United States does not want to maintain troops in Korea for the purpose of restraining China. Um, so, in fact, I think when unification happens, uh, it will be a benefit to U.S.-China relations because there are many people in China who are suspicious about America's intentions. Um, and I think we can easily prove them wrong um, after unification. In this case, uh it isn't interesting for China, to my mind, to have some problem with the United States because of inefficient and unpredictable regime in North Korea. If the Korea Peninsula will be peaceful, will, will be without nuclear weapon, if uh, Korea will be prospering economic country, and there will be no any uh, you know, challenge, security challenge to China from uh, the Republic of Korea, from, from Unified Korea. I think that China will support this kind of unification. Uh, maybe China will take a significant part in this unification, in modernization of Korea. And China will be interesting to be integrated in unified, unified Korea, to play a, a significant role in economic processes and to uh, support some kind of integration between Japan, the uh, Republic of Korea and China, and to create global and very serious uh, economic organization which can compete with other world. The U.S. and China may appear to have different approaches towards the Korean Peninsula, but they do not stand at opposite ends of the spectrum as they did during the Cold War. Moreover, the 21st century is an era based on economic cooperation and competition. You cannot disregard the fact that the U.S. and China have close ties when it comes to their economies. Uh, U.S.-China relations today are competitive. Uh, for sure, the U.S. is the dominant power in the region. China is the rising power. So it's a competitive relationship, undeniably. But it's not the U.S. and Soviet Union. The two economies need each other. When the United States had a financial crisis, there was no country that wanted more to see the U.S. recover than China, because China held most of our, you know, a large percentage of U.S. debt. Similarly, um, uh, the United States does not want to see the Chinese economy fail. If the Chinese economy fails, that's bad for the U.S. economy. That's a very different relationship than the United States and Soviet Union. Despite that, experts say it's important the U.S., China, and South Korea take clear approaches when it comes to the issue of unification to dispel any misunderstandings. I think the U.S. and China can work together uh, to promote unification. 
but they need to clarify for each other their strategic intentions. <clears throat> the, the U.S. needs to assure China that uh, the United States will not use a unified Korea as a threat to China. And the Chinese need to reassure Seoul and Washington that they have no intention of propping up a North Korean government uh, against the hope of unification. But we need to somehow get China to see it's in, that it is in its interest to see unified Korea. So that takes efforts from both United States and South Korea. South Korea needs to say, listen, you are already our number one trading partner. We're going to have an even closer economic relationship. It's not going to be so bad if you have unified Korea. It also requires for the United States to say, okay, we, if, if our troops remaining on the South Korea, on the Korean Peninsula, is so much of a concern that in a unification scenario, we'll move the forces out. Because when you really think about it, there's no reason for United States and U.S. forces to stay in a unified Korea. Moving beyond ideological differences or power struggles, a unified Korea will bring real and tangible benefits to surrounding countries. The U.S., Russia, China, Japan, and other surrounding states will first see results in the field of security. Well, for the United States, North Korea is the biggest source of instability in the Northeast Asian region. One of our top concerns about North Korea pursuing its nuclear weapons program is that one day North Korea might um, proliferate nuclear weapons or parts or its technology to countries like Iran. It already had that kind of relationship with Iran, Syria, Libya, Burma, Myanmar. Um, so that's a big concern that one day um, they will proliferate its te nuclear technology, uh, which is definitely um, a big concern for us. It will reduce our defense uh, burden because we won't have to station so many troops in Northeast Asia uh, to deter North Korean aggression. Currently, in the environment surrounding Japan and the issue of security, North Korea and its nuclear program is the problem. If the Korean Peninsula is unified under South Korea, I think it would automatically resolve the issue of North Korea's nuclear program. This would be a very fortunate development for the security of Japan. It not only solves problems on the security front, it opens up a large and attractive market for competition. Besides, not a unified Korea will be a great gate for Russia for Pacific area. Unification will bring about great benefits for Japan, given that it will provide a larger market to enter. Um, it will also be a great economic benefit because a, a unified Korea will have uh, economic opportunities that will be um, beneficial to the world. It's a, it's a huge win for the United States and the international community if Korea is unified. There appears to be a common belief about the need and legitimacy of unification both home and abroad. But when it comes to the question of who and how, we need to take a step back and carefully review the issue. What kind of specific roads are there to take in achieving unification? Germany is a country that once shared the same fate as Korea. How did it achieve unification? Also, what struggles did it go through after becoming one country? Here's an outlook of what lies ahead for Korea.